Hey everybody, welcome to Wood Chat for August 15th, 2012. I'm Matt Gradwall from Uppercut Woodworks. Uh, you can find me on the web at uppercutwoodworks.com or on Twitter at uh, Uppercut Wood. And today's Wood Chat is just a hangout with uh, woodworkers. We're not going to have any real celebrity woodworkers with us today. But we do have M. Scott Morton with us, at Morton on Twitter. And he's been working on something special, so why don't you let us know what's going on? Sure. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, I've been working uh, in my shop on a commission project, which is a large dining room table. Uh, it's about 10 and a half feet long by about almost four feet wide. And uh, it's got two leaves, and the leaves are actually um, at either end uh, of this table, so they can uh, be removed to make it down to like a six-foot table. So there's basically a two-foot leaf uh, at either end. So it's a bit of a design challenge coming up with uh, a leaf that large to be removed at each end. But the coolest part about this table is the fact that I got the whole top basically out of two boards. Uh, it's a walnut table, and the boards for the top are English walnut, and they're about two feet wide, uh, obviously, to make up the four foot in width. And they came into my shop at 13 feet long. Um, so they were huge boards um, that I got from a place called Artisan Lumber, uh, which is nearby me, and they carry just awesome, uh, spectacular wood. Uh, it's definitely a little bit pricey, but everything is air dried and everything is local to me, which I really appreciate. Um, so I've <clears throat> just been working on this table for a few months at this point, off and on. Um, but now it's really rolling along. I had a lot of design challenges up front, um, a lot of design not really uh, finished from the, the leg style and size and curves and stuff like that. So I was doing a lot of template making to, to kind of see what it would look like. Um, but now I'm really into the, the, the construction end to end. So the top is um, pretty much glued up at this point, not, not finished or finished sanding even, but the substructure's in place. The top's in place, um, and now I'm working on the base. Uh, it's a trestle-style table, so there are two legs um, and a stretcher across them. So I uh, just today mortised uh, the legs for the stretcher um, that will be removable, um, and then tomorrow I'm going to start mortising the top and bottom foot on the legs, um, getting those together, so then the base will all be together, and I'll really be on my way. So that's what's been in my shop for... A few months now it's been a real blast but working with this large wood I was telling Matt earlier is just uh, a real challenge because I'm used to working with just regular sized you know pieces of lumber for making furniture even if it's relatively big furniture when you work with chunks of wood that are you know 10 to 13 feet long by a couple feet wide um, especially in a smaller shop my shop's medium size but I don't have that big of machinery so a lot of stuff has to be done by hand and then even the legs are pieces of wood. There's some crotch walnut, about eight quarter, that came in my shop, about five, six feet long by eight quarter by almost two feet wide. And that's those, those are making up the legs or part of those. And so even breaking that stock down and mortising it, I can't get my mortiser or my drill press to the center of that piece of wood. So, again, I'm using, you know, hand drill for drilling out. Um, starting the mortise there in the center and then using a router to finish it up. But um, using large chunks of wood is definitely a challenge in a smaller shop. But it's been great, and I'm really looking forward to seeing it start coming together in the next month or so. So did you um, did you hand flatten all those slabs with hand uh, I did a lot of hand flattening, so wow. I'm much better at hand planing now. Um, what I did for the, for the two-foot wide boards, uh, I did. I used... Uh, basically a really cambered iron and went straight across to sort of flatten it. And then I used the joints or plane going diagonally to bring it down. Um, unfortunately, it's very wavy grain. So once I started removing material, uh, it started moving again. Uh, so I've been sort of fighting that. And that's why I had to add a really big substructure uh, to try to hold it in place, some battens and aprons to try to hold the wood uh, in place. <clears throat> but then also what I used was I would hand plane one side, and then if it fit through my, my planer, of course, I could flip it over and put the other side through the planer. The other thing mm -hmm. I used was my drum sander, which is an open-ended drum sander. So then I could take sure. a piece that's even longer, wider than 12 inches, and run it through, you know, the open-ended drum sander. Well, so when this thing's built, are you going to be able to get it out of your shop? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, did think, I did think about it. I'm glad you brought that back up, and that's one of the reasons that the stretcher is removable. Ah, uh, gotcha. Uh, first, okay. the stretcher was going to be in there, but then the, the legs would be too wide to try to pull out. So, you have pictures? I, I do have some pictures. I've been 
um, actually posting a lot of pictures on my Facebook account. Um, I try to update that a few times a week with current progress in the shop, and so that's facebook.com slash mscottborton. Okay, I'm going to try and get those into the screen share real quick, um, just so people can see kind of what you're talking about here. Yeah. All right, let's see. Oh, and this is when you were doing the uh, honing of that plane. Yep. Yeah, I was posting some of that. I was playing around with the, um, you know, there's been that the YouTube video of the chip breaker, you know, the close up. Um, yeah. You know, the Japanese, um, you know, I don't know who did the original video, but I saw that. And then, of course, Chris Schwartz jumped on and, and did some testing and had some pictures. And I also um, played around with it. Basically, what I found, in my opinion, was, or from my experience, was I, I first moved the chip breaker <clears throat> really close to the iron as close as I could get it mm -hmm. and um, and that made uh, left behind a really good surface hardly any tear out but it was very hard to push um, the hand plane um, and it left these really crinkled shavings Then when I rehoned the chip breaker the shavings were probably hitting each other on the way through that small gap I don't think they were hitting each other I think they were I think the chip breaker was pushing them into you know pushing a wrinkle into the next wrinkle Oh, gotcha. Okay. And then when I rehoned the chip breaker, that definitely made the shavings look more normal, but it was still hard to push the hand plane. So to mm -hmm. me, it was like, okay, if you don't have a higher angle frog and you're having tear out, this is a good thing to try. Yeah. But if you're not having tear out problems, then of course, just leave your plane like it is. It's easier to push 45 degrees and just, you know, make it happen. Uh, so I think I've got your photos up here. I'm going to oh, yeah, go to the first one in the series. That's a little shaving. <laughs> right, so here's yeah. the first one in the series. So yeah, that's just an inlay, um, an inlay design for the top. So the top is going to have um, some inlay down the edge. Um, you okay. Know, just trying, just trying to highlight it a little bit. And here's working on the uh, big slabs. There it is. Like. That's one. Yep. That's one board. So one half of the top. Uh, okay. And that that's actually a really nice end. The other end has has some knots and other grain kind of swirling around. So that end you were showing there is um, really nice straight grain and was really easy to plane. The other end is um, a lot more wavy and kind of tearing out and stuff. But gotcha. Uh, and then this is the uh, that's apron. part of yeah that's part of the apron and it kind of curves up a little bit towards the end and I you know I beveled it on the table saw and then. Where the curve happened, I just grabbed a spoke shave and kind of yeah. you know melded the bevels together. So is this the design? That's it. That's it. But I've changed it a little bit, so you can see. Um, the thing that I changed most is the stretcher. Right here. Yep. Exactly. So I was going with those five bent laminations, um, and basically it was going to become a real hassle, a real hassle to make that. And yeah. When it came down to it, I just didn't think the time involved in making that was going to be worth it because it's a stretcher that you don't see that often. This perspective is like from a two-year-old that you're yeah. looking. So, you know, you'll just barely see kind of the bottom of that stretcher. I mean, so I just decided to make it one solid piece. So it still has the curve top and bottom, but it's just right, okay. wood now. Substructure pieces. This was um, creating a ton of battens uh, to try to hold that top in place. Yeah. Uh, countersinking all the all the screw hole elongated screw holes, etc. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and painting them black. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I used. I actually used um, a black dye. Um, I don't know if I did it in water, alcohol, and, and did one coat of that. And then I actually mixed a black pigment with shellac. Um, and that actually gives a really nice finish. Was that just trans tint? Yes. Cool. The pigment was not. The first coat oh, was... I, I could read it right there if I was just looking. It's right there in the video. <laughs> then, yeah, Mars black pigment. Cool. Domino. Yes. You addicts. Uh, you festival addicts. And you're... Domino is just unbelievable. Is this the XL or just the Domino? It's just a regular Domino. Gotcha. And um, there's actually, I said that the top was made of two boards, which is essentially true. There's actually two inch edging on either, down either side, just okay. to round out the 44 inches. So 
Um, I just use dominoes to align those those two inch pieces. Okay. And those are my tools for flattening the top. The Black and Decker dragster. Yep. I see a lot of metal in there. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, Scott, you haven't you haven't sent me one of your joiner planes yet, so. <laughs> I see some epoxy and some knots. Is that what I see over here? That's exactly right, dude. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> that works pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm using epoxy all over the top of this. There's a lot of knots and cracks, um, which is just going to, you know, really add to the feature of the top. Um, but yeah, I used a lot. I've used the epoxy filling before. It works great, and it looks really nice too. Um, did you ever try one of those uh, handheld like Makita power planers? I think I they're mostly not. used. I think they're mostly used on job sites for getting doors to fit. Yeah. Um, that's a nice long shaving there. Yeah. Yep, that's off the edging. Just um, getting it ready to glue on. Turns out, quickly tuning up a card scraper really does make a difference. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it does. Um, yeah. were, you, were you doing some scraping of the epoxy too? How does that respond? Oh, epoxy scrapes great. Hand planes great. Scrapes great. That's awesome. Yeah. And then you got your big. Uh, so yeah, this was this was cutting off. So I first flattened each board um, individually, and then glued them up together. Did a little bit of flattening once they were together, and, I, and this is basically the state they're still in, and I'm at this point probably going to take a lot of sandpaper to it. Yeah. Um, but here I'm cutting the two leaves off. So this is ten, about ten and a half feet long, and I use my track saw to cut the leaves off. Yeah. Um, is the blue tape there just for tear out? Yep, it was an extra precaution. I don't get tear out from the Festool, but I had one shot to do this, and... Um, and so I just put down some blue tape, you know, gotcha. for extra security. If you didn't oh, well, have that black paint turned out cool. Yeah. So what if, was the question? If you didn't have the uh, the Festool track saw, would you still make that cut with a circular saw? Uh, and, and like a guide? Yes. Yep, and I'd use more blue tape and yeah. Yeah. I, actually, what I would do is make a zero clearance for a circular saw. Yeah. So I'd make a straight edge, and I'd probably put something on the other edge. I'd probably cut through. I'd probably add like a quarter inch on top, and then and then run a curve down that first, and then you know, and then run it again. Yeah. And maybe get a new blade. And, and that's what yeah, I was going to mention too. Yeah. Definitely sharpen or get a new blade. You know, I find that if. Um, I got a crappy Porter Cable circular saw. It's like 12 years old. But a new blade with a zero clearance, 3 8 inch yeah. Baltic birch on there, and then just um, a good straight edge seems to work pretty darn well. Yeah. Um, and I don't get a lot of tear out on the underside at all. We actually, uh, for my brother's kitchen table that we just made out of, uh, it was 8 quarter Sapile mahogany and uh, breadboard ends. So to get the ends perfectly straight, we tried using the circular saw, and it was, like, burning up. I mean, it was smoking. Oh. It's, it's like a rigid worm drive circular saw. So we ended up just uh, setting up a wooden fence, clamped it down, and used a router with a 3-8 straight bit. Yep. Went down, like, three-quarters of the way. Yep. Jigsawed off the, like, the, the side we cut off and then just flushed it up. Yeah. And that worked perfect. Zero yeah, tear out, idea. zero burning. Worked really good. No, that's a great idea. Fortunately, I didn't want to waste, you know, a router bit width. I was trying Probably to. Really, in, fact, in fact, I was, you know, thinking of some crazy thoughts about trying to hand saw across yeah. to get a really small curve. Oh, yeah, that's crazy talk. I was like, uh, with your well, boy Underhill or something? <laughs> yeah, I was like, no, this track saw works really well. <laughs> Just wait for Forrest to come out with a thin kerf. Yeah, full track saw blade. <laughs> I bet you could have taken the blade to a saw shop, though, and said, hey, can you thin up my curve here? Yeah, probably could have. Okay, so there's the uh, the steel in for the uh, for the leaves. Yep, exactly. So I um, – who made those? I just, those are just drawer slides. They're heavy-duty, Acuride 500-pound uh, drawer slides. Yeah, okay. 
um, three inches tall and, um, and then just, you know, screwed them to an apron and then put another chunk of wood on the other side. Um, Why'd you pick those instead of some uh, table hardware? Were these just better? Um, not necessarily better, um, but I have, I've used big table slides in the past, but what they're, um, the table slides I'm mostly familiar with are ones where you have leaves in the center. Oh, right. And so when you have a leaf at the end, this is a pretty typical way of doing it, having some kind of mechanism shoot out and then just rest your leaf on top. Right. Um, and you could do a simple like uh, pipes I've seen. So you just have pipes and you just pull them out. Um, so this just has a this just has uh, part of the explain how the leaf works. Maybe I missed yeah. that. Part. Yeah, yeah. So th there are two leaves, one at each end, and they're about two feet wide, or long, I guess, by almost four feet wide. Um, and so what happens is there are runner. There's aprons in the main six foot section. And those aprons have these drawer slides, and so like, but they're just drawer slides. There's no drawer. You just pull them out from the end, and then you rest the leaf on top of them. Huh. That's cool. Yeah, and then, then there's going to be some mechanism for, you know, of course, leaves like to drop over time. So I've got an idea how to have a mechanism kind of at the very lower end of this picture attached at the far end of the leaf and uh, a wedge, and it will come back to the, there will be a chunk of wood from the, the far end of the leaf back to the leg on an angle, and then that piece you'll be able to Did you have to put your own curves in there, or was it is it natural edge? So yeah, that's that's the thing. The um, the piece of wood that I found basically had the curves in the grain. Of course, I had to you know bandsaw it and, and clean it up and everything, but um, it really had that. It's actually I got the legs of this piece are um, and there, and Matt can pull up some some pictures. I think there are some online. Uh, yeah, we had a um, we actually had. A technical problem where the video was out for a while so um, I think the last picture we were looking at was uh, of the slides and now we're on to this ape, uh, the curved ape, uh, stretcher part but I can, yeah. I can keep going here I gotta if get the go through, go through if you can find any of the leg pictures the legs are from a um, uh, let's see that's just yeah, yeah there's the new there's the new stretcher actually if you want to go yeah. back so there's the new stretcher. It's just a chunk of wood. Yeah, I like it. I like that. And, and you know what I like about it? It it yeah. kind of echoes the battens on the sides. Yeah. Or underneath the top. So I think it's for some reason this reminds me of Frank Lloyd Wright a little bit. I don't know why. Yeah. It wasn't he didn't really do that curve, but is it just one big mortise in there, or do you have a couple 
couple mortises in there. So what it is is the stretcher is removable, um, and so I'm using a joint like a I don't know the the name for it, but it's a it's a half dovetail, um, and then the wedge creates the other half of the dovetail. So it's used in workbenches, knockdown workbenches is where I've seen it. Hmm. So the tenon at the end of the stretcher has a half dovetail on the bottom, and so you shove it into a mortise and it drops down, and the mortise also has a matching you know, half, half pin or whatever you want to call it, drops down into that, so you have a gap at the top. Oh, so you pick it up. A pin, you shove a pin in the top that has the opposite tail, dovetail, so it wedges the stretcher cool. into the mortise. Cool. Um, hopefully it's going to be really tight. I did some testing today, and I might have to mess with the angle, unfortunately. I, I think I made it too steep, but... Mm. Uh, so that's how the stretcher is going to be uh, attached. <clears throat> These so this are looks pictures. like you're just making a template here. Yep, that's exactly what that picture is. And there's the leg. So it's comprised of three pieces, middle, top, and bottom. I don't know what to call them. Um, but the middle section is from Crotch Walnut. Oh, cool. And, and there's some pictures of that, and that's what actually you had up, Matt. The, um, I was following the grain to kind of fo to find that curve. Um, uh, okay. And there'll be some, there's some other, I think there's some other Wow, pictures. that actually matches that curve pretty well there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I spent a lot of time, and you guys are familiar, I spent a lot of time trying to find the right pieces of wood that are going to work and then trying to use the grain, you know, where I can, you know, to, to sort of fully define the, the curves and stuff like that. It makes a huge difference. Did Artisan Lumber, did they let you, did they let you pick through? Yeah. Find yeah, the right it, pieces? Yeah. I mean, what they they don't have like a tremendous amount of stuff. Like you would you would never go there and say, "Oh, here's my cut list." You know, I need this much four quarter maple and cherry, or whatever. They they just have what they have. So you got to go with an open mind and then poke around and see what's there. And, and Brian, the owner, is just awesome because you know I'll go and I'll spend an hour or two talking with him and I'll tell him the project and he'll take me around and show me different bits of wood. So that's I'll cool. Say, yeah. I've got a leg. I need this. Yeah. I got a top, you know? Um, and so he'll take me around and, and we'll look at all different kind of boards. Finding a lumber yard that will let you spend a few hours picking through to find the right pieces is pretty cool. But Where's yeah. Arson lumber? Um, it's in Lunenburg, Massachusetts. And they're okay. online, and when you when you go there and you look at their prices, you'll be like, holy smokes, this thing's astronomical. And their prices online are really, really high. Um, when I go in person, it's, it's just the, you know almost a one-man shop. It's this guy, Brian, has been doing it for ages. And he's got a crew that, of course, helps him and everything. <clears throat> and he's into a couple of different businesses for, for his wood. But uh, furniture makers, you know, he doesn't make any money on, on me coming there and buying a few sticks of lumber. So. No. He he usually is giving you know giving me a nice deal when I show up and buy you know three or four things. Yeah, That's I've cool. got a desk design with some arches that um, until I find those piece the type of piece that will match like that. Yeah, I'm not going to build it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to find a place that'll let me look for a long time. <clears throat> It just looks like some pieces milled up here. Oh, this is that crotch for the end, huh? So there's the leg. Very cool. You have matching crotches on on both sides, or is it? That's actually so. That was that was what I was leading to. Was I got four of them. <laughs> nice. So, and they were all like five feet tall. The crotches at the top, and then it was just straight. In fact, the leg picture you saw earlier with the chalk outline, that was the lower section, which is pretty mm. straight grained. And this is the upper section. Um, and so two of them are the two legs, and I had two extra pieces, and that's what became one of the stretcher. It just had the right curve um, along the, the six feet, and I could barely, barely get a stretcher out of it. In fact, I think I need to move my legs in half an inch or so from my original, but um, that's where the stretcher came from was a third piece of that. Okay. Oh, the tooth blade, huh? Yep. Tooth blades work really well for not tearing stuff out. And that crotch walnut, when I'm trying to take, I needed to take a lot of material off, you know, to try to get it down to flat. 
and man, you would just take out chunks of wood with a cambered blade going across it. Yeah. Uh, tooth blade, unfortunately, I can't take as much wood. I mean, the camber blade, I can take a lot of material quickly, but the tooth blade doesn't tear out at all. Yeah. That's cool. I gotta make myself a toothing plane. The tooth and and that's from that's from the Lee Nielsen sixty two and a tooth blade you can I mean I shouldn't say you can take quite a, amount of, a, a lot of material but not as much as I can take with a camber blade I mean there I'm taking almost a sixteenth of an inch at a pass. Yeah. What's this one here? Oh, is this for the stretcher? That, that's a stretcher. That's cool. Wow, that fits just perfect, doesn't it? I'm telling that you, the length would just right on the line. The length, I have, actually, I haven't even checked the what I ended up for with the the tenons and everything, but the length, I, I you know, I think I had to bring in the legs by half an inch or so to get all the tenon to the very end of that. Gotcha. Uh, but yeah, those are the curves basically drawn in, so you can see how well it matches along the natural edge. Is this the table that you and you and Chris got talking about that inspired Chris's table as well? Or you guys inspired each other? How that? Because I that arch kind of comes into his too, right? No, I haven't. Um, you mean uh, Chris Atkins? No, uh, Chris Wong. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Blair. Yeah, Blair. we were. Yeah, we were talking. Um, yeah, I think. I think. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. Actually, now I remember. I've been working on this table for so long because I I do this uh, part time. I have some other things that I do as well, um, and uh, so I was doing this trestle table and talking about trestle tables, and I had some different designs kicking around. And then Chris was like, "Yeah, I want to do a trestle table," and so he he kind of fired up, you know, that interest and and went off doing his his whole maple thing. I don't think I don't think any any designs were influenced one way or the other, but I think the original trestle table he might have just you know got inspired by you know because I was kind of working on one. Cool. Wow! And this is the amount of twist in that stretcher. So if you could see the back um, winding yeah. stick. Yeah, the two winding sticks, it's pretty wonky, man. Yeah. So what would you do? Um, <clears throat> I pulled out my hand plane again, um, and I had about a half-inch material to remove from the corners and then kind of feather it in from those two, those two corners, and then I flipped it over and ran it through the planer. Cool. But that. a better way of doing it, <laughs> which I should have done is um, because it was about 11 inches wide and it, it does have a curve to it but at the ends it's maybe 11 inches and I have an 8 inch jointer I should have jointed the 8 inches um, and then uh, flipped it over onto a piece of plywood and run it through the planer mm. that would have saved me some work although that being said it would be hard for me to run a Six foot by eleven inch by eight quarter piece over my jointer, so it took yeah. me about an hour. It took me about an hour to flatten one side by hand. That's not bad. No, like I said, I've gotten better at hand planing. <laughs> you definitely got your practice in now, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> how uh, how much material did you end up taking off of that? It looks like what two inches thick right there. Yeah, I took off about a half inch on each corner to start, and then you know, playing the other side, um, it ended up yeah about an inch and a half. Okay. And I didn't, I didn't get end up getting rid of all the twist. It was flat, and I came back the next day, and it had popped up again. Um, and I could have taken it back, and f I did a little more flattening, and then it popped up again because this is crotch walnut. Um, and so, interestingly enough, I, I, I'm hoping that it, I don't know, it'll probably end up moving a lot over its lifetime. But in my shop, I think it's been pretty stable at being off by a twist by like an eighth of an inch over the six feet. So I did a test of putting, ten, I put the tenons on, the ends, and I made a jig for the mortises. And I ran the mortises on really square pieces of wood and then put them on either end on my bench and they were off the off the flat by a sixteenth of an inch, and it wasn't the full it wasn't a full leg, so that sixteenth of an inch was maybe over a foot or so. So I actually ended up twisting my jig by a tiny amount and ran my mortises. So my mortises are slightly twisted in the two legs to make up for the fact that the stretcher is slightly twisted. Mm. But you'll never see that 
with it's you. actually no, kind of cool. You see, I was just trying to save myself hacking off a eighth or a quarter of an inch off the foot to flat, you know, to flatten the four feet once the whole thing yeah. was together. So I decided to slightly angle the mortise as a start, and then we'll see, you know, how close we yeah. get the, the the four feet on the floor. It's it's kind of cool that it's twisted, actually. Like if it was really twisted, you could almost incorporate that. I, actually, yeah, yeah, you definitely could have. And then this is the shaving experiment. And this is the shaving experiment. Back to the back to the shaving experiment. What's the shaving experiment? So I don't know if you saw the. Oh, it's interesting to ask a plane maker about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The I don't know if you saw the chip breaker stuff that's been kicking around YouTube and. No. So basically, there was an experiment it, of. Was this the one where the, the Japanese video where they they were testing? Yeah, I I, I saw that. The the, the honing the chip breaker, moving it like yeah. super close, and then honing the chip breaker. Yeah. And Chris Schwartz had a couple of blog posts on it. And I was just playing around, um, really not much of a particular reason, but decided to just try it out. And um, so there's the first shaving. I got the exact same thing that when I just moved the chip breaker, which I don't, I guess I don't really know what angle it was originally honed at from Lee Nielsen, but when I moved it to within, you know, a few thousands of my iron, that's the shaving that comes out. I get I get no tear out. It was really great. It was hard to push, um, and then when hard I hold, to get the shaving up through that narrow gap. Yeah. There's no narrow gap though. What narrow gap? I thought you had a narrow. I thought you had the. Chip I had the breaker. chip breaker way up, but I had the mouth open. Oh oh. Really okay. At yeah. least I think I at least I think I did. Someone else pointed that out, and I, I think I had the mouth open because I've had problems with with the mouth not being open enough, and so I generally have it pretty open. Gotcha. The way that's folding like that, it, it looks like your mouth was closed, but that's... You know, I can go back and try it again. Well, I can't now because I've honed the chip breaker. <laughs> <laughs> you have to buy another plane. plane. Oh, a different plane, though. And then here's the shaving after I honed the chip breaker. Okay. But if so I... That the chip breaker not being honed is is clogging it up. When it's honed, it allows that wood to, to slide off it a little more. Well, here's the, here's the thing, though. I don't think the mouth was closed because the chip breaker would have come originally honed. I, I think it's like – I think I increased the angle. Okay. I, I honed it to 80 degrees, and I didn't remove a lot of material. So I added a micro bevel to the front of the chip breaker, and I, I'm pretty sure I didn't move the mouth opening – you know, in between those two. Yeah. So I think the mouth is open. I think that, and then so now the chip breaker has a higher angle. And so the question is, why is a higher angle, you know, not produce that shaving? Now the wood is is this the wood not the shavings different? The wood was the same. They, they were right. both plain fine. I mean, I mean, it was great. It's just hard to push. So if you don't have a problem with tear out, you know, I wouldn't mess with anything. Well, thanks for sharing that, Scott. That was pretty cool. Um, I want to show you guys a picture that Dale sent. Um, I want to show you a picture Dale sent us of some shavings here because it's uh, pretty oh, yeah. nice. It's, it's pretty ridiculous, actually. I'm going to do the view full size here and then do the uh, screen share. Come on, Google+. Plus, You can do it. I don't know if you guys can see that very well, but... Those, those shavings almost like look like thinly sliced pieces of deli meat. <laughs> I mean, they're so thin, but they shine. They shine. They're like burnished. It's yeah. pretty nice. And uh, looks like Japanese planes in the background. So the East versus West gang war continues <laughs> on hand planes. <laughs> um, Honestly, I, I look at Dale's. Uh, that's DJO Furniture Maker, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I look at his planes and I, I'm envious of them. Actually, I, one of these days I'm going to make a uh, a Japanese style plane. Just I'm, that was the inspiration for the the Kronoff had for the Kronoff style. So, um, and I actually find myself using mine on the pole stroke a lot more. Anyway, so oh really? So you make oh, yeah. a Kronoff style and you pull them? Yeah, I I I do more side. 
uh, pull them by the side and pulling than I do pushing. So it's just more comfortable. Hmm. Um, he says that's a four inch a four inch blade. Is that four inch wide? Really? That's what he said. Dale, if you're out there, can you, can you get in the hangout? I invited you. Let's let's answer let's answer some questions, Dale. Yeah, get on here, Dale. I just sent him another invite, but uh, and no, what's a sub blade? I'm not sure what a sub blade is when he talks about a sub blade. I don't know. If that's a four inch wide blade taking shavings like that, that thing's got to be ridiculously sharp. Yeah, and I want to know where he gets it because I want one. <laughs> a four inch wide blade? Yes, absolutely. Just take a hawk blade. <laughs> four inches long, turn it on its side, it's on its side. <laughs> sharpen it, hone it, and you're good to go. There we go. <laughs> four inches wide. Oh, he's not on G+. I just sent you an invite. Wow. How did I do that if you're not on G+. That's kind of crazy. Stub blade, stub is, blade is chip breaker. What's that? He says stub blade is the chip breaker. Oh, the sub blade is the chip breaker. Okay. That's what, that's what I thought. So what, he's just working with the post that uh, wedges the blade in there? Or he's working with, is is the wooden wedge the chip breaker on a wooden hand plane? No. Or no, can you no. still have a metal chip breaker in there? I'll, you can. But the wedge usually isn't. The no, wedge yeah, is usually too far. You have a metal, metal chip breaker on a wooden plane. Okay. Yeah, it just attaches to the iron the same as same, same way. Well, I'm going to put that in the stream again so I can look at it a little. It doesn't even look like he, he's got the wooden post, right? Because um, no wedges on Japanese yeah. plane. The yeah. iron's usually bed right into the into the plane. Yeah, so you can see, if you look, you can see my mouse pointer here. There's a uh, there's an opening, but the blade wedges right into the. It's hard to see, but there's a there's a, a recess in the body. That's wider than the opening for the shavings, it looks like. There's no post going across or anything. Yeah, that's what that's what plane makers floats are, are for. When they uh, when they chop that open with the with the chisel and then he will float that. Gotcha. And, uh, get those nice and even across there. So So this shaving is oh that's a two by four. Right here. And that's the same width. There's a video of it. Oh, we lost Scott. There is a, there is a video. There is up there. There's lots of videos. Japanese plane. I don't, I don't even know where it's at anymore, but the, the blade is like 12 inches wide, yeah. and they're planing a beam. I think we're losing you, Scott. Am I, am I cutting out? You were yeah. a little bit, yeah. I know what he's talking about though. There's this the yeah. video of this of this plane that's like 12 inches wide, and they're taking a shaving that's like just ridiculous. It's like 12 inches wide. So How many people are pushing the plane? Two. Two people. Yeah. Or maybe it's one. Amazing. But they're pulling. But they're pulling it right. Yeah. One person's tapping a blade back and forth. Yes, and we're pulling the shaving. Uh, the other one's pushing the blade. They're pushing the plane. Or pull I think your internet is kind of cutting in and cutting out on us. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we've only got about 15 minutes left. Is there anything else people Sorry want to about talk that. about in the chat room here? It's kind of a just open mic night. Let's see if there's any questions in here. Blade is held in place by the plane block called the die, or the D D A I. I don't see any other questions in here. Oh wait, there's another link from Dale here. Making a high high hybrid high angle plane for figured woods. So it looks like a Japanese plane with a chip breaker and a wedge. And a dowel. Well Scott, what have you been working on? More planes? What's that? 
You just been working on more planes? You're working on a project? Uh, planes. That's all I've got time to do anymore. <laughs> yeah. So I've, I've got some other stuff I want to do, but, you know, got to keep the bills paid. So. Bose Video Wave Entertainment System. Brian, is this the, uh, I think I found your kitchen table. Let's put that in the screen share. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it's finishing up in the basement. That's got a. Uh, that's actually only six coats. It's got seven coats of water locks on it, um, rubbed in, so it's they're not thickly laid on or anything like that. And uh, came out really, really nice. Never used the product before, but I would definitely recommend it. Yeah, in fact, that's exactly what I'm going to be using on my dining room table. I'm building. I did some tests with it, and yeah, it looks really nice. And I just used it one or two projects ago for the first time. It seems really great. Yeah, um, it, it, are there it more takes a little, uh, down further there are. The, that's the bench I'm working on right now. It's like a child's chest and bench. Here we go. So is the Waterlock a uh, wiping varnish? Oil, yeah. was it oil-based? Yeah, it is oil-based, and they actually, it's a uh, tongue oil in there. And they ask, they recommend that you brush it on, but you can also rub it on, too. But you just need to use a couple more coats. Yeah. Yeah, I ended up brushing it onto a um, kitchen island, wooden kitchen island top, and it took like three or four coats to build up, you know, build a yeah. nice finish for a kitchen island uh, by brushing it on, just sanding it in between. It was great. Is there there's a varnish in there then too? Yes, there are resins in there. How uh, how much time are you putting in between coats? Twenty four hours. Yeah. So to do seven coats, you're doing a week. Yeah, and then it actually, they say it takes 30 to 90 days to fully, fully cure, but uh, they say you can start using it after seven days. I could believe that with tongue oil. Yep. That is cool. I like those dowels. Though, if you go back a little bit further, I actually had to make a doweling plate for those Wenge dowels that we used to draw bore the, uh, the breadboards in. Yeah, there it is. Just real simple, made it real quick at the drill press, and uh, just knock the hell out of some, you know, strips of wange through it, and it just becomes a circle. So. And you start up here with the bigger hole and work your way down to the smaller one? Yeah. And people actually said, I, I actually tried it, it worked pretty well too, where you can, uh, you can uh, chuck up the wood in a drill and just drive it through with a drill instead of hammering it through. Interesting. Hmm. That's good. Yeah, it's interesting. No, I just got the dowling plate from Lee Nielsen because I couldn't be bothered making my own. <laughs> and I'm going to be going through that probably next week, actually. Yeah. How, how thick is that? that? That's actually a plate off of a like a disc sander, disc sander that we had from a while ago. So it's a, a sander that we don't even use. It's never worked. Now this is the miter slot here, right? Yeah. So we just took it off and used that. Hmm. So like half inch thick, maybe? Probably, yeah. On the sides, it's probably half of an inch thick. Hmm. So, didn't bend or anything like that. It, it's it held up real well. We'll definitely keep that around. You don't have to worry about the the wood going through squirrely, and you end up with a a a, a dowel that's not straight. It's well, we were putting through like a. They were probably 20 inch long pieces of Wenge and just going through it once and then we chopped them down into shorter pieces. But it definitely, when you put the Wenge through, it definitely bowed it a lot. Okay. Because I'd be worried about having a a curly cue that has a perfect diameter, right? But but it's not straight. Um, yeah, but, yeah, but who cares if you're cutting it down into small pieces? Yeah, if yeah. it's going to be small enough, I guess. Yeah. That's cool. All right, well, let's look. I'm gonna look for more. Uh, I'm gonna look for some uh, questions from the chat room. And if there's if there isn't anything, we'll just hang out. All right. Uh, um, wrap up. Um, looks like Dale built some cabinets. Dale's got a lot going on today. Dale, you got to get Google Plus so you can come in the hangout and share your stuff. Dale was putting a uh, 28 dowels. He said, "I saw uh, to hold together his whiskey cabinet." <laughs> I think I think that's the picture he just sent. Yeah, it is. That's a lot of dowels.
So per side, it's three, seven. Yeah, so he's got seven each corner, four corners, 28 dowels. <clears throat> I would probably just do some dovetails. <laughs> I would pull out my domino. <laughs> Cheater. Yeah, I, uh, I'm trying to avoid even starting the festival crack habit. Yeah. I, yeah, I understand, but the, the domino is a real is a real changer. It's really interesting to be able to make slip tenons in a matter of moments. Uh, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, well, will you ever make regular mortise and tenons in a situation where you could use the fest tool though? Um, I actually am in this case on this table. I could use the uh, for the foot. There's a foot that goes onto that that main leg section, and I could run four or five dominoes in there. And instead, I'm gonna I'm gonna probably draw more a mortise and tenon. Um, but the thing is, I'm a little hard pressed to say why I'm doing it that way. Yeah. You know, because I don't. I, I mean, the joints is stronger. A drawboard mortise and tenon is definitely stronger, but. Uh, I just can't see that the domino is failing in, in any situation. No. But I'm just doing it this way just to do it this way. I sort of had it in my head to get it done this way. But, no, I'm basically – I'll use the domino any chance that I can because no one cares and time is money. Yeah. Um, so, Mark, uh, Loogie's saying basically that if you if you put in a good dowel – if you put in good stock into the dowel maker, um, your dowel's never not going to end up any more wavy than the width of the stock going in. So basically, you know, you're going to start with a square. Maybe like like if you do a half inch dowel and you start with a half inch square piece of stock and you nip off the corners, that's going to end up being much better than if you just go at it with something rough. It sounds like so that makes sense actually. Um, cause it's probably, it's, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, cause if you, ha especially if it's symmetrical all along its length, I guess, it's going to be less inclined to twist and turn as it goes through. So cool. All right. Well guys, I think we're going to wrap up. All right. Um, tonight was open mic night. We had four guys in the hangout, uh, besides me, which is cool. Um, so, Hey, thanks for sharing your table, Morton. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was you. pretty cool. Really liked it. Good. Um, all right, so I'm just going to type a couple of messages here to the chat room. Um, we're going to be back next week um, at the same time, Wednesday at 6 p.m. Pacific, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, what I'm hoping to do is some people find some people who are at Fine Woodworking Live so they can give us their impressions, especially if they've been at Woodworking in America so they can compare and contrast. And then at some point in the future, Matt Kenny says he's going to join us for a wood chat, um, but he wants to kind of get, I think, past fine woodworking live and get recovered from the hangover that that probably creates. Um, but that'll be fun. So, anyways, thanks guys for for joining us tonight. Thank you. We'll Thank see you guys later. Wood chat. See you next week. All right.